Welcome back to our series on multivariable calculus. In this particular episode, we're going to once again look at center of mass and the concept of the moment. Except in this case, we're going to deal with variable densities that vary across two dimensions. We'll still be doing flat, planar center of mass. We could actually do center of mass of volumes as well, but that's going to involve triple integration, which we're not quite ready for yet. Okay. Our concept here is going to center on this idea. Now, our mass distributions are going to be functions of x and y. So with our density varying with x and y, the only way to take into account the impact of the density on each position is to actually do a double integral. There would be no way of handling this with a single integral, because while x changes the distribution's density, so does y, and I couldn't integrate both variables simultaneously if I chose to do them as single variable. This basically brings us to the same idea of finding a center of mass through doing a weighted average. It's just now the weighted average is going to involve double integration. The first integral we need to perform is to actually find the mass. And of course, finding the mass is going to be easy. I'll integrate over x from x0 to x1, and y from y0 to y1, and all I have to integrate is the density function itself. The density function with respect to x and y, dy dx. Once I perform that double integral, I'll actually know the total mass, the mass that's distributed around the entire area. Now, if the density distribution is simple and the dimensions of the object are simple, you might not even have to integrate in order to get this. You could just directly calculate the mass. For instance, if the density were a constant and this were a rectangle, then the area would in essence be the same as the mass distribution. Okay, well now that we have the total mass, that's going to act as our denominator for our center of mass calculations. We need the moment in both the x and y direction, and they don't look markedly different. As a matter of fact, there's one advantage calculating the moment with a double integral, and I'll show you that. So first, mx. Again, this would be the moment where we want the moment around the x-axis, so we'd be integrating in the y direction. That means we're going to need an extra y in our integral in order to take into account the vertical distribution of the mass. So it'll still be the same limits of integration. x0 to x1, y0 to y1, and we'll still be integrating the density. It'll just now be y times the density function dy dx. You notice, even though we're sort of integrating this vertically, I didn't do anything different with the limits of integration, nor did I have to reconfigure the function. And that's the advantage here, is because I'm, I'm basically integrating left to right and up and down, I don't have to change sort of the function that represents the height. We had to do that for these one-dimensional integrals because they were two-dimensional shapes that we were integrating one-dimensionally. The height always had to be explicitly stated in terms of the uh, direction we were integrating. Because we're doing double integrals here, we can ignore that. We're always integrating in both directions, so I don't have to sort of take into account how the function relates. Uh, certainly, any of these limits could be functional based on the shape of the, the actual object that we're finding the center of mass of. So it's certainly true that either the initial or final y or the initial or final x would have to be functional, in which case that would choose my uh, direction of actually doing the integration. Okay, correspondingly then, my, which is the moment around the y-axis where we're basically looking at the x distribution of mass, would be the same limits of integration. And now it's just x times sigma times dy dx. And as I indicated earlier, that's what kind of makes these two-dimensional center of masses a little bit easier. Uh, of course, you're still going to have to worry about the limits of integration actually taking into account the shape. But the integrand, what you're actually integrating, is much simpler than if these were one-dimensional integrals. Correspondingly, if I locate the center of mass, and the density function is a constant, we refer to that as a centroid, because if the density function is constant and not based on x or y, then the area uh, basically becomes the total mass, and in that case, uh, the geometric center of the object is also where the center of mass is. 
but if the density varies where the mass is located as a function of x or y, then we'll actually find that the center of mass is not located at the geometric center, and that's the distinction that that word centroid implies. Well, let's then look at the final calculations. Again, the x center of mass then would be the ratio of my to m, and the y location of the center of mass would be mx to m. Again, keep in mind that when you're calculating mx, the moment about x, you use an additional y, and then correspondingly, when you're actually looking for the y center, you use the mx value. So I know it seems counterintuitive, but keep in mind that these moments refer to the axis that we're measuring it about rather than the dimension that we're integrating within. Okay, that about does it for center of mass and the idea of a moment. Uh, our next step then is to move on to surface area of our 3D functions. And you might wonder, will we ever do this with uh, a three-dimensional object and find the center in three dimensions? And of course the answer to that is yes. All we would need is a three-dimensional density and of course we would need a z-coordinate for the center. But of course for that we'd have to be performing triple integrals in terms of x, y, and z. And we'll get to that eventually.